Hello and welcome to the Real Off History Podcast, a podcast where five of us discuss history for a bit over an hour. Today's episode is about our opinions on the second best empires in history, with obviously the British Empire being the greatest. Um, we shall begin with a short news segment of things that happened in the last two weeks with Peter. Um, so the first article of our episode would be regarding the state of emergency declared in Sudan by the president. Um, president Omar al-Bashir has appointed a new prime minister and declared a one-year state of emergency, which would dissolve the government and allow the security forces to have the ability to just crack down on the protesters. Um, the protests in Sudan demands the regime head by Bashir to step down. And although Bashir did recognize some of the demands of the um, of the protesters as legitimate, he stated that a lot of the student leaders are trying to use it to gain a political advantage. Um, some of the, the protests also regard to a constitutional amendment, which would allow Bashir to to run for more terms for the presidency, which he's been in power ever since a 1989 coup. It's just, honestly, this is just another blatant example of, like, someone in Africa trying to institute their own dictatorship on something, right? Like, Yeah, they're trying to, like, legalize it through the constitution. Yeah, and what is it? He dismissed all the um, the state Federal. governors, right? Yeah, they did. It, it's gone, now, basically. He, he, I, I guess, in a way, he's doing that to just like, well, add instability to the country so that no one can form like a real organized opposition because there's no one like in power, and then he's obviously gonna fill them in with people that support. I think it's a, I think it's a desperate ditch on control to try to use to um, go over the rule of law and just take control of the country directly with him as the apex of power. Yeah. I mean, 57 people have already been killed since December, and if the country does deteriorate into a state in which law enforcement would be impossible, then, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, it's like, if South Sudan wasn't enough, like, breaking away, South Sudan's now in a business, like, now Sudan's going to... And it is just this. Business. Yeah. God. Do you guys think he'll actually step down? Mm. I don't know. It's a very volatile situation there. Indeed. I don't know. I think... I find it interesting that he postponed the constitutional amendments that will allow him... Because you'd think he'd be trying to pass that as fast as possible. Well, he's seen what happened to in Armenia. And he sure so isn't going to do it again. Mm. I, guess, I guess that's true. Um, next, next story, I guess. Yeah. Next story, yeah. um, the Venezuelan crisis continues to escalate as border caches regarding the um, the aid intensifies. Venezuela has just blocked off the border to Brazil in an attempt to stop the American and the Western aid coming into their country. Um, the opposition leader, Juan, Juan Guaido, who's declared himself the interim leader, um, is trying to get the U.S. to send in the aid which is needed for to help with the humanitarian situation um, due to the government of Nicolas Maduro. Um, an estimated 2.7 million people has fled the country um, since 2015, and there's still going to be a humanitarian concert which um, Guaido is. I think he's going to attend. Yeah, and he's actually attending with the president of Colombia, Chile. Oh yeah, uh, that's right. And some others. Yes, correct me. I, I'm actually. I'm. Can I just say I'm amazed at just how many people have fled the country. Like, what is the population of Venezuela? It's like, isn't it like forty million or something like that? It, it, it's pretty. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, 30, thirty-two million, right? And I mean, and with the Syrian refugee crisis, this is comparable. They've lost nearly ten percent of the population. Mm. Like that is, that yeah, is so in 2016, the, pop, the population was 31 million. 2016. Yeah. And since then, the inflation has gone through the roof, the economy has collapsed, and the Giro has just clamped down on everything. And yeah, really and he's still not admitting that there's a crisis. Mm. Mm. Which, like, we've gotten to the point where I don't even know what, what he's thinking about. Yeah, and, and he's even opposing the West, not just by keeping the, the convoys out, which will help aid the country, but he's actually launched 
a counter concert on the opposite side of the border. I was going to say, yeah, I read that. <laughs> Oh my god, that's hilarious. That's actually, it's actually it's, So it's 500 meters, from, if I remember yeah. correctly, it's 500 meters for where their coyotes have, or I can't say I the name. I was to the point where, like, the Venezuelan president is fighting with concerts. That's just... Mm. That sounds like something yeah, Trump no, would right. be doing. And you know what I find out interesting about that is, wasn't, doesn't Maduro, like, claim it to be a socialist government? Yeah. yeah. Like, Somewhat, he keeps yeah. going on and on about, like, you know, stop the imperialism and whatnot, and that's like, he yeah. doesn't claim, claim to say well, his main claim is just what Hugo Chavez has been doing, which is an extensive amount of nationalization and social programs. Mm. Yeah. Well, there's been more uh, situations like that around the world this week, especially in the Kashmir. Um, India's top court has ruled the government to protect Kashmiris throughout the country because there's been widespread retribution from everyday India following last week's massive suicide bombing in the Kashmir. And there's been reports throughout all these cities, all the major cities in India, that Kashmiri students and businessmen have been beaten up. And there's also been a lot of anti-Pakistani protests. Um, on the 14th of February, this is where this whole situation came from. A suicide bomber blew up an Indian convoy. Um, they claim, well, at least India claims that Pakistan had a hand in this and killed over 40 Indian um, paramilitaries. Mm-hmm. And while there have been many public beatings from general citizens of India. There have actually there's actually been quite a large effort from the Indian people to protect the Kashmiris and invite them into their homes to keep them safe. Oh. I would also like and, to, uh, well, if you allow me to talk, um, I'd also like to point out that Pakistan denies this and has warned it will retaliate if India takes military action. Exactly. Yeah. Did um, Pakistan say that they were going to retaliate? Sorry, Jack, I didn't quite get you. Ah, uh, yes, Pakistan denies it and has warned exactly. that it will oh, retaliate. Okay. And they said if so, India starts becoming aggressive to them, they will, you know, fight back pretty hard. India countered this by saying that they're going to try completely isolate them and they're going to dam three rivers flowing into Pakistan. But Pakistan just this week has hosted the Saudi crown prince who's starting to forge closer ties between the Pakistanis and, and the Saudis. And it's starting to escalate a bit. And, and the but, Pakistanis have support from China as well. Exactly. Well, so, that's probably the only reason why, like, Pakistan actually has all those interesting yeah. projects from China is because China wants to undermine yeah. India's authority. Yeah, India's the, one, is the only, one India's the also only the way, left one road policy yeah, is the big rival back. next to them. Yeah, yeah. On a less serious note with regards to that story, the cricket world... I was about to say, is, yeah. <laughs> hanging in the balance. <laughs> I could, I'll, I'll, quote, <laughs> I'll quote the BBC <laughs> here and say the tension between neighbours may also have an impact on cricket. Yes, India. Well, that's what it all matters, doesn't it? <laughs> There's a potential that India will boycott the game against Pakistan, though nobody from the Indian cricket board has actually said anything at this point, just to clarify. Thank you, Will. All right, so are we going to be moving on to... The topic okay. itself? Yeah, yeah let's more? get on to... Uh, I, I think, I think we've about? covered most of the majority of news. Hmm. Uh, all right, okay, so let's... We'll move on to, like, the main topic of this episode which is what well each of us five are going to pitch what we believe to be the second greatest empire um after the british empire which we can all come to consensus on saying that that's the greatest empire the land now, is, I'm, like, now I'm gonna lodge a protest the central african empire oh. anyway <laughs> never mind we're talking about the second know, greatest empire, not the best okay so um well do, does everyone just want to say what those are my the one i'm going for is the Portuguese Empire, um, um, I'll be doing can... the Spanish Empire, and I'll be doing the Ottoman Empire. I'll, I'll be, be doing... doing the Japanese Empire. I'll be doing the Mongol one. All right. Oh. So, but before I start with the Portuguese Empire, I just want to say, like, an, an honorable mention of mine. They may not be the second greatest empire or an empire at all for that fact, but um, I like I find it pretty cool. Like, we can, like a little fun history fact that the knights, the hospital, hospital of um, St. John, right, the Knights of St. John, they actually had colonies in the Caribbean, which is like, if you know anything about the Knights, they had two tiny islands in the Mediterranean, Malta and Gozo, and that was it. And somehow they managed to get all the way to the Caribbean, purchase a bunch of islands off the French, and then like, I think they had it for like a couple of decades before selling it off again, but like, I find that pretty amazing, actually. Did they like not have any external help? Um, I think... What I think what they did was they it was um they bought it off the French but they kept most of the um 
advise um, like the French people there. I, I, I don't oh. think so. But it's been a while since I actually read it up. But yeah, I think that's how it works. Um, anyway, well, Portuguese Empire. So, although certainly not as large as the Spanish, French, and British empires, I honestly think that it's a worthy contender for the title of second greatest empire because it was the truly, it was the first truly global empire, like an empire that you could consider to be truly global. Um, because they were the, they were the people that paved the way for all of the, the, you know, global European empires to follow them, the Spanish, the British, the French, all of that. Because, I mean, if you look at this Wikipedia that, um, this Wikipedia page that I'll, I'll, we can show in the video, it shows a chronology of European exploration of Asia. Well, the second, this, um, and the second wave of exploration, right? So this begins in 1497. And over the next 50 years, it is only the Portuguese exploring, like, Af all of the African coast, Asia, India, like, China. It it's pretty amazing. They, 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 what is it? They, they made several trips to India, they conquered Goa, they found the Ascension in St. Helena Islands, which are pretty key in the Atlantic. They established the first European fort in India, they conquered Hormuz, they conquered Malacca, which both of those are key trading centers. They were the first to establish diplomatic ties with an Asian nation, that being the Kingdom of Vandithaya. They built a fort on the Spice Islands, their first expedition to the Red Sea. They tried to take it in, but that was a, bit, that was a failure. Um, they were the first to land in China. Obviously, I don't think they were the first Europeans. I'm pretty sure some went overland, but they were the first to sail there, I'm pretty sure. They were the first to find Japan, the first to find the Philippine Islands, and like quite a bit more besides. But the thing I find pretty amazing about this whole thing is that for 50 years, up until 1549, it was only the Portuguese exploring into the East. It was, it was solely them. They paved the way before any other empires, and they were the first to establish a truly global empire colonies in you know Southeast Asia, India, Africa, and obviously um, they had it in South America and in the Caribbean as well, and in Europe making them global. And like the next Europeans to do something significant in the second wave of exploration beginning in 1497 was um, some Spanish missionaries, right? Which were there in 1549, they went to, and, and then even after that, it, it's still the only exploration is pretty much only Portugal, and then there's some Dutch people that come after them. It's like for like a hundred years, it was 150 years or something like that. They, they, they were just it was just the Portuguese. I, I find that pretty amazing. They practically discovered the whole of the African coast from like Western Sahara to Somalia. They also had an early domination on like colonization of non America, like in Africa, for example, they set up colonies in Arguin and the Cape Verde Peninsula, um, modern day Dakar. In 1445, they snatched the Gold Coast up in 1482, made several movements in Morocco to the city of Malindi in East Africa in 1500, setting up the first like sort of trade posts in East Africa, the first European trade post, uh, before expanding into Zanzibar and the coastal regions near Dar es Salaam today. And they set up their colony in Mozambique in 1502, which was way before the Cape Colony was founded by the Dutch, right? They, it's like, it's like 150 years or something later, they founded the Cape Colony. They established their colony in Angola in 1575, which was, you know, like 200 something years before the, um, before the, um, what is it, the scramble for Africa. And at this point, the only other European power, but at 1575, when the Portuguese had all these colonies, was Spain in like little pockets in North Africa and the Canary Islands. Over the next century and a half, the Portuguese, Portuguese remained the dominant European trader in Africa, only up until the Dutch took some of their West Africa from them and founded the Cape Colony in 1653. The Portuguese were one of the last Europeans also to relinquish control over these African possessions, you know, shortly before the Spanish yeah. gave up their last colony of Western Sahara, I'm excluding the possessions in Morocco they still own, and France giving up their last colony in Djibouti. You know, I think, I think the fact that they were able to do so much more than like others where they paved this way it makes them in my opinion like the second greatest empire and I, I did a little bit of maths here right so the british empire was 107 times larger than the british isles right 33.7 million kilometers square is the british isles versus 315,200 kilometers square wait no sorry the other way around 350,200 kilometers square is the british isles 33.7 million kilometers square is their empire right the spanish empire was only 27 times larger um 
13 million kilometer square empire versus 506,000 kilometer square um, country. Portuguese were 112.7 times larger than Portugal in Europe, right? With being 10.4 million kilometer squares versus 92,000 square kilometers of Portugal. So I think if you judge it by that, I would honestly even consider them greater than the British because they expanded their country like 10 times more than, well, sorry, 112 times larger than Portugal um, in Europe compared to the British only doing 107 times larger than their um, land in Europe. So I think that actually sort of makes them better than the British, and I'd even consider them the top contender for that fact. Like, you know. I mean, we really have to consider the importance of the Portuguese Empire when when they basically were one of the first to basically form this sort of um, New World colonialism, and they were the last ones to relinquish their control. Well, yeah, they were, well, I wouldn't say they're not the last, but they were like third last. Well, one, so. one of the last, because by, yeah. by, by the time we get to the 1970s, the British empires and the, um, and the other ones pretty much only had control of like Hong Kong, and even that is just like, you know. Yeah. And I mean, well, meanwhile, the Portuguese I, has significant control over other pieces of and territory. The, the, the thing I find most interesting about that, the fact that by that point in time, by like ni- the 1900s, Portugal was not even close to being an empire anymore. They were, they were not even like considering the top. Yeah. The mm-hmm. British were by far and away the highest, and even the French, like you know, the British and French had controlled them, but they still held on to their colonies longer. You know, I, I, I don't know. I find that I actually find that pretty interesting. The fact that they did I so was, much in such a little bit of time. Yeah. I mean, that reminds me of this book I was reading called um, Conquerors, How Portugal Forged the First Global Empire, and some of the expeditions and journeys and voyages are just, like, the daring is crazy, and what they managed to pull off with such a small yeah. amount of troops in India, it's just nuts. Like, basically, like, the entire confederacy of the Indian south, the southern area was against the Portuguese little, you know, the little fleet that the Portuguese sent to India, and the Portuguese still won. It, it's pretty amazing, honestly. Like, um, what is it? The the similar story with like the Spice Islands. They they didn't they sent I don't even remember, but they sent a pretty small force of troops. Like it wasn't that many boats. And then they sent it over there, conquered the Spice Islands, built a couple forts and were like, bam, this is Portuguese now. It's like mm. there were there were there were like oh, kingdoms? No, not kingdoms, but like, you know Duchies, whatever the equivalent would be for um Malay, um or Indonesian like sultanates, you know, whatever that is. There were yeah. countries there, right? There were countries there, and they managed to conquer with like a couple boats. Yeah, halfway across the world, more, like more than halfway across the world. Uh, I think that's pretty amazing. Mm. All right. Well, does anyone else have anything to say about the Portuguese? Well, uh, the Portuguese these days, when we're discussing major empires, you look at, you know. The ones that are quickly come into the mind, you know, maybe the Japanese or the British. The Portuguese has unfortunately fallen off the map quite a bit. Well, yeah, I mean, they, they actually, I have to say, if you look at the stuff that they still actually own in the Atlantic, I'm yeah. kind of surprised they still have them. I'm, you know, yeah. the Spanish oh, yeah. only have the Canaries, the British, well, the British and French are the exception, just because they've got stuff all around the world. And it's the French especially. French yeah, just don't I mean, like to give French up their quite a lot of stuff. <laughs> But yeah, the Portuguese have held on decently to this day, I reckon. Yeah, and like, though, though, I mean, even in World War Two, they were pretty significant in like the geopolitical mm-hmm. of the Atlantic, right? Because mm. both the Axis and the Allies like fought over, you know, the Azor Island, and ultimately, like, you know, the the British Portuguese um, alliance meant that the British got a lease of it. But, like, I don't know yeah. the, the fact that. They still and, controlled that and, much influence when they were pretty much a backwater at that point. Yeah. And, you know, the uh, start of Novo was quite smart in staying out of World War II. And actually, mm-hmm. one thing I should mention, which I did, is the fact that even a lot of, like, the Spanish exploration that was done was done by Portuguese explorers just funded by the Spanish. Like, you know, other than, I don't think, this Columbus, obviously, but, like, some of them that went into the East, especially. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I would also right, so, point out uh, at this point, just um, quickly, that uh, there will be a variety of images that we'll, I'll put on the screen while Cam is talking. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so I'll start with the Spanish now. 
I would also like to have a little bit of a Knights of St. John tribute at the start because I think they're honestly one of the, the so cool organizations. Like they I were in the Mediterranean, just in, in the Caribbean, just everywhere and helping out with the Spanish and, and against the Turks, chai. But yeah, they, they, they really were effective fighters and then. Remove the kebab. And the one thing I love the most about that is the Knights of St. John pretty much, they still exist. They still have passports, they still have a military. Yeah. I mean, they don't only really land, they only have like a couple of buildings in Rome, but they still exist. I don't know. Uh, uh, honestly, anyone listening, search up the Knights of St. John and have a read of the Wikipedia page. Like, and that's it's very like, interesting. It's, it's, quite when you're a, there. it's quite when, amazing. Yes. When you're there, you should read about the Siege of Malta, and that's, there's some heroics in the Knights. Oh, which one? The first or the second one? The Turkish one or the, um, the, uh, I mean, actually, they're very valid, you know, I mean, sort of brave and, and heroic fighters. The ones against the Turks were just okay. staggering, though. That was actually the really impressive. Very, very. The cross is, like, amazing. Mm. Flat that thing on the flag. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'll start with Spain now. I personally think that the Spanish Empire must be considered the greatest empire of all time in some facets, even challenging the British, due to its complete domination of not only Europe where it was centred, but the whole globe which it came close to commanding. The sheer wealth of the empire and the unparalleled influence that it wielded in its lands in Spain, Morocco, Portugal, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Italy, the Mediterranean, and the New World was staggering, and it was unquestionably the greatest empire of the age, even challenging the British at that point, and the impact that it left on the world can still be felt to this day in so many ways. From the beginning of the empire in 1469, when the House of Trastamara in Aragon and Castile joined, Spain became a great power of Europe. But after the addition of Granada, Naples, Sicily, the Burgundian lands, and Milan, Spain became the great power in Europe. Their military was ruthlessly effective and near unbeatable on the battlefield for nearly three centuries. They defeated the Turks in their struggles in the Mediterranean from 1526 to 1791, especially at Malta and Lepanto, which would permanently cripple Ottoman naval power. They defeated the French in the Italian wars, the wars of the League of Cognac, and the Genoese Savoy War. Along with the Napoleonic Wars, they absorbed the Portuguese in the Iberian Union, and they defeated the British in the Austrian Succession War and the Anglo-Spanish Wars. And even when they lost in these big wars, like the Eight Years' War and the Thirty Years' War, the Spanish somehow prevented the inevitable collapse of their empire against colossal odds. They were the greatest military power of Europe for the best part of three centuries, as I'd already said, and they bested most of the great powers while doing so. Further, the Spaniards were the greatest New World Empire without question. The entirety of the South American continent, apart from the coasts of Brazil, the entirety of Central America, the southern United States, and the American West Coast, along with complete control of the Caribbean, was, you know, all this land was controlled by them. The amount of gold and silver that flowed into Spain and the wealth of the Spanish monarchy was colossal, and experts think that about 180 tons of gold and 16,000 tons of silver flowed into Spain from South America. While the British and the Russians had larger territories by surface area than the Spaniards, the Spaniards controlled useful territories, ones controlled with gems, gold, silver, cacao, and other precious items. Not to mention their colonies in the Philippines and Africa were useful additions. The Spanish controlled the entire Pacific Ocean for decades before anyone else broke in, the first being Francis Drake in 1578 and essentially dominated half the world's surface area through this. No other empire came close to the Spanish um, until the Russians or the British centuries later in terms of surface area, and nobody could challenge the Spaniards in the New World for, you know, un until the French in Canada and the British in America. They just had the monopoly over the entire New World, along with, you know, the 60-year period when they controlled the Portuguese. Um, I know Cam was talking about how great the, the Portuguese explorers were, but the Spanish also achieved some pretty amazing things themselves. I mean, the first circumnavigation was a Spanish mission, eventually completed by a Spaniard after Magellan was killed in the Philippines. Not to mention it was a Spaniard, or at least a Spanish mission, that discovered the entire New World in the first place. The Pacific was discovered by Vasco, Nunez, Balboa, a Spaniard, and most of South America was also Spanish discovered. The Spanish conquered the empires of the New World with relative ease against huge odds. Pizarro conquered the Inca with just 168 Spanish soldiers and some native auxiliaries, and Cortes conquered the Aztecs with just 3,000 men and 100 cavalry along with 32 guns. 
the Spanish discovered the majority of the interior South and Central America alone. No one succeeded in penetrating to the inside of a continent of that scale until the rest of the, rest of the Europeans about 400 years later during the scramble for Africa. And their exploration was among the greatest in the world and even rivaled the Portuguese for daring. Further, Spain still has relevance and an impact to this day. According to the National Encyclopedia of Sweden, Spanish is the most spoken language on earth, which is the national language of more than one nation, and the language with the most native speakers on earth in the same category. Spanish military innovations are still in use today, such as guerrilla warfare, the Molotov cocktail, the submarine, and in history they produced the hardest steel in the world in Toledo. Spain invented the guitar and music. Art-wise, they produced some of the greatest painters like Velázquez and Picasso, I mean, the Spaniard invented a spacesuit in 1935. They invented the calculator, the mop, the distillation of alcoholic beverages, the wheelchair, our Gregorian calendar. Spain's impact still resonates around the world to this day. And without question, I just feel due to their colossal power at their height and still relevant today, despite being a relative minor power of Europe, they have to be the second greatest empire of all time due to all of their achievements. Wait, can I just say something? Wait, you're done, right? Yeah, yeah. Wait, okay. you said they, they created Are you sure? Warfare. Wasn't that the Lusitanians that, um, and I'd sort of consider them Portuguese more. I don't know, I would consider them... Iberians. Okay, no, I'm, I'm, Iberian. I just searched up a uh, ethno ethno-linguistic map of um, the Lusitanians and whatnot, and it categorizes the Iberians as the... Um, Pre-Celtic Lusitanians. I don't know. I I thought I always felt that the um, Lusitanians. Got a bit of statistic. Wait, hold on. Can we go in order, please? Uh, <laughs> yes, Peter. Um, regarding your um your 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 thing around the languages, could you specify what you mean? Is it the most okay. amount of countries in the world that has Spanish as its official language? No. What I meant to say was. Wait, I'll read out exactly what I said. It was. It, it's the it's the most spoken language on earth, which is the national language of more than one country. So excluding China, basically, it's the most spoken language on earth. All right, that's All what right. I that's what it is. All right, I see. Yes. You guys got anything else to to say? Um, um, I I think I think the um, I actually I do agree with you in in the fact that they are. Are pretty amazing because, like, if you look at the New World, oh, yes. majority of the New World South, is mainly Spanish. Much all yeah. of South America, right? Was Spanish, not just, obviously. Not Brazil, just South America, like, including Central uh, America, Western, and North, North America. America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Basically, those... anywhere that wasn't the U.S. or Canada had a humongous cultural influence from the Spanish, even to this day. Even no, even, even the U.S. Did. Yeah. yeah, there's a well, map. The, US, like, the whole the yeah, whole West Coast young. is basically Spanish. There's a map that I will put on screen at afternoon editing, and it shows the Spanish, the extent of the Spanish Empire from 1340 to 1600. And on that map, you can see the uh, in orange the Spanish colors and how big their empire was. It was pretty big, but uh, actually, one, very... one 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 mark I'd like to say yeah. about the Spanish is they didn't do too much in Africa, like the scramble for Africa. Well, yes. All they really owned was, but did they really need Northern to? territory? But the Portuguese, no, I'm, well, I'd like to say that the Spanish didn't last as long as well. Oh yes, as long as the Portuguese in that regard, because obviously, like okay. I said, the Portuguese not, not just the Portuguese. All, I, most I, I nations you could say the bigger you are, the harder you fall. I guess. I think it's yeah, more. That's true. true. The Portuguese more than with the exception of Great Britain, of course. Well, well, I mean, look how hard they fell. Look at them now. True, Brexit. Yeah. Best no, the whole thing. Yeah. The reason why the, the Spanish didn't do anything in Africa, and the reason why the Portuguese didn't do an awful lot in the Americas, is because of the Treaty of Cordesillas. So, yeah. I don't oh, know. Yes, I guess it, it's kind of a point against both of them, and a point for both the Spanish and the Portuguese. Yeah. I think it's something we have to take into account. Yeah, and I, I like That's the fact true. that both the Spanish and the Portuguese had a complete monopoly on colonization. Yeah. Because obviously there's like strategically located for that being so close to the new world and whatnot compared to mm. other nations in Europe, yeah. Mm. Which you know, bred this like maritime tradition. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Being the British I mean, now, not even. I mean, their their power in the new world was pretty good, but just like their whole control over Europe for so many decades was also pretty. Yeah. Like the influence they had I mean, was 
was actually pretty significant. We also have to consider the cultural influence of the empires. In that case, the Spanish Empire is undoubtedly one of the most influential um, empires or any nation actually in the world in terms of culture and their ability to work with the locals and just how widely basically all of South America uses Spanish. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. The, la- oh, the language, it, the language is basically. In the end, I, I do believe it could become a strong contender to replace English as an international cut language yeah, simply yeah. because so many yeah, people yeah, uses yeah. it. Was mm. it? Wait, I mean, was it at any point? Or, oh, actually, no, that was French, wasn't it? That was, I mean, no, it the international French. language is French, yes. Before English. No, English is now, isn't it? Is it now? Yes, it, it is the English. It is the international I'm, language you, now. You say that, huh. but to be perfectly honest, I think I think the Chinese is going to be, Mandarin is going to become the. Um, well, I mean, who the hell speaks? Well, China, in, in, in the real. eastern part, half of the hemisphere world, probably I would see well, that. Think but about more focus with the west. It, it's mainly Spanish, while the east is drastically well, Chinese. Generally, yeah. the world is speaking English as a way. Oh yeah, generally yes. yes. Yeah, but I mean, I over think over time point... we'll probably start to see this decline. Hmm. With the Chinese I'm language like, coming up, with the Chinese well, like, just becoming such I'm a big like, power. I find China. that. Oh yes. I find that really hard to believe because for for so many years, China has never explored this language outside exactly. of, of the own case. And if you think about it, the only reason, let me think about it, with the number of native speakers, right? It's with the number of native speakers, it's eight hundred and seventy nine million, um, according to this website, and non native speakers one hundred ninety three. The difference between native and non native speakers. Yeah. Is well, you look at English. If considering that there's 898, no, sorry, 983 million, um, there is 371 million native and, and 611 million non-native. Yeah, that's which that's I think really pretty really much confirms difference. the fact that the the Eng- there's a very slow low chance that the Chinese language would take over simply because it's concentrated in one country. I feel yeah, I should. Well, all, I feel actually, at this point that I should point out that. Um, China has has entirely, under Xi Jinping, changed its diplomatic outlook as it's actually now focusing more outward, as before it was more focused inward. Let's, like, not not talk about that. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Just to let everyone know, we're going to refrain from getting uh, too controversial with governments, so we're going to refrain from any uh, controversial government policies and types, such as Xi Jinping's reign, as you don't want to offend any people. It's controversial in some cases, which is, you know, some people have a little this and that. <laughs> but adding on to what Peter says, in the case Chinese does expand as a language, I can kind of see it does because, like, in today's households, eh, like, more more people are – so now ethnicities are kind of being mixed together. So, like, before, as we saw, like, maybe in the early 1900s, it was usually your white on white, Asian on Asian. But nowadays, we'll see, like, white on Asian – and mixture is that. That's why I kind of, I would kind of see Chinese kind of like becoming a more dominant language as like Chinese being more spoken in different households between mixed ethnicities. But I so, think such as myself, Chinese people that, that at least a lot of Chinese people that leave um, China, oh yeah, speak a different language before they yeah. leave. Yeah, especially the, the, immigration the is quite big as well now. If the majority of the population is going to just be in China, then how it's going to expand? Think about it. Mo- most Chinese schools. Even like public universities have English as an official curriculum, right? Mm. The amount of countries that have Chinese as a national or required class is minimal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but I just kind of have to agree with Sean. Like, even though more and more people, because of you know having two cultures in their house, and, will start speaking yeah. Chinese more. It's not going to really uproot, you know, the entrenched Spanish, English, French yeah. kind of, you know, three-way, you know, domination of world languages. I, I think they just they've just been, you know, the key languages around the world for so long, especially in most of the colonies, that it's going to take a while before somebody like China, who's only just started pumping out Chinese to the world. Yeah. Well, you say that, but if you look at like the communities in Southeast Asia, there's a lot of Chinese in. Especially the business people are like the amount. Obviously, if if you look at the other side of the world, like in Africa or in America, oh yeah, yeah. nothing. Well, I mean, Africa, you might see an increase simply because you know the one belt one road. China's like trying to increase influence and build a lot of infrastructure. Oh my god! Please stop. (laughs) 
<laughs> Guys, maybe we should maybe we should refocus because we've kind yeah, of yeah. We should off. we should go back to the original topic. So we're gonna cut this off, but I'm actually putting my life on the line, and you guys are just ready to kill me thirty years down the road. Oh my goodness! <laughs> that, no, I feel, I feel we should point out at this point that Peter is Chinese. Uh, oh yes. So, okay. Wait, so, we're, no, gonna we're gonna cut, cut this, this guys. We're yeah, cut we're gonna so, cut this. We've gone off on such a mega tangent. No, I, I mean, mean this, this could go in. Yeah, yeah this, this is good. This whole Chinese. This is go. Okay, no! so let me let me refocus. Let us refocus. Now, Peter's worried he'll get executed by the freaking government. <laughs> it's fine. Don't worry. Just uh, put him in Florida. Well, I mean, God damn it. We said we weren't going to get controversial, God damn it. All right. Yeah, but this uh, ain't controversial. Uh, this is just let, let's casual let's start, banter. All right, shut, let's just start in like five seconds and we cut that bit out. I don't okay. Want to cut that bit out. I know, but guys, what are, what are we going to talk about if we just cut that entire China section out? I'm not going to cut the entire China section. You may no, have... Like where, no, like the bit where we just started freaking out. I don't know. Okay, I'll, I'll, when I go through it, I'll go through it tomorrow. Well, Cam, if you want to come on the call tomorrow, I'll go through it. Yeah, you guys. Okay. And sure, we can go yeah, through it together and we can work okay, it out. At, at, at this point, we're cutting this out. Oh, of course, we're cutting yeah, what we're saying out now. Uh, I mean... Wait, wait, wait let's just do it. Can we get into a nice segue that will link back to what we were talking about with the... Yep, sure, oh, I can do it. Oh, wait, no, let, let's Sean do it because he's next. Oh, uh, no, oh, I'm next. No, Jai's next, Jai's next. Read the no, no, oh, podcast chat. Okay. We changed those things. It's 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 on the podcast, it's always been like that. Yeah, I'm last. Okay. Um, okay, I will, I'll, what I'll do is I'm just going to yeah, okay. say, can Count we be. In. All right, can we be quiet okay, for three, like five two, seconds? One, go. Wait, wait, wait. Can we, I need quiet for five seconds. Yeah. Just, okay, what I'll do is I'll just count, I'll count to three and then just be quiet for five seconds, then I'll start. <clears throat> All right. Excuse me. One, two, three. All right, now moving back to the topic at hand. Uh, in, it is my belief that the Ottoman Empire is the best, well, the second best empire, next to the British, of course, as it is one of the longest lasting empires in the world. It went from 1299 to 1923. Now, at its height, it held the territory from Hungary to Yemen and from, the, from Algiers to Azerbaijan. It was one of the strongest empires in the European U- region. It didn't focus as much on colonizing as it did consolidating its region. Uh, it finished off the Byzantine Empire with the conquest of Constantinople, which soon became their capital. Now, this central capital between two continents made the Ottoman Empire the center of interactions between the Eastern and Western worlds. It allowed them to gain a monopoly on the key trade cities of Alexandria and Constantinople. They held this position for six centuries, conquering and forging an intercontinental empire. They integrated many different and multicultural people into this empire, which led their empire to have a vast diversity, which also helped them keep their reign for so long. Now, the Ottomans held the title of Caliph, which means leader of all Muslims worldwide. They also controlled the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, most important c- cities in terms of Muslim beliefs. However, this did not mean they marginalized all the other region- religions. Sorry, Until the latter half of the 15th century, the, Aut- the empire actually had a Christian majority. Now, it managed to keep the people mostly happy as it maintained this empire for so long. In terms of the military, the Ottoman army was one of the strongest amongst the and advanced in the world. It was the first to use muskets and cannons. The Ottomans utilized tactics similar to the Mongols, as Peter will talk about later, to outwit its opponents. It was also the first institution to hire foreign experts and to send its officers to train in Western countries. The Ottoman navy, while it had its downsides, also contributed to its territorial gains in Europe, and at a brief time, it was second only to the British and French. Now, the Ottoman economy at its height was trading blows with the French and had a higher average income than Europe and Japan. The liberal trade policy that the empire chose to pursue contrasts to the protectionism of China and Japan at the time. At its height, it had more population than the British Empire and the Holy Roman Empire combined. With the point that I've stated and the images that I will show later, uh, I have to conclude the Ottoman Empire was the second greatest empire in the world. However, as the others have pointed out, their empires are also in contention for this. But its military might, its diversity, along with its booming economy, does add a lot of points to its name. You know, with the um, I should add something. With you mentioned, wait, you're done, right? You are yeah, done, right? yeah. Right. With, with the um, military, um, the Ottoman cannons were bloody amazing. Yeah, they really were. Like if you look at the um the Dardanelle guns, for example, they they were amazing. And then you had the the um the guns that actually yeah the Dardanelle guns, the ones that actually brought down Constantinople's walls that kept it alive for like centuries. 
mm. I don't know. I think there's like incredible feats of engineering. Yeah, those Dardanelle. I think Gar- the the, I thought I should point out the Dardanelle guns had a barrel like the 518 centimeters. It was <laughs> they had dang. they had a thousand and fifty four like millimeters big, big. of diameter. And the Ottoman was really, really keen on using gunpowder as well. Yeah, they really were. Yeah, they were an extreme the group that really wanted to use the um the scientific resources at their disposal in order to conquer and to attack the um the other nations as effectively as possible, which was one of the reasons. That yeah, made something it that I successful. forgot to mention is also that their research was second to none at for a time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. like I was going to say, yes, the yes. only reason they didn't colonize was much like the Arabs before them. They didn't need to because they already believed they were number yeah. one in the Not world. Not just that, they were also right? mainly they focusing didn't... on internal expansion rather yeah, than yeah. colonization. They want to expand the I mean, borders internally inside Europe and Africa and a bit of the Middle East. I mean, so, yeah, at their height in 1683, they held so much of, you know, the Balkan area and they also held oh, yeah. most of North Africa along with all the former Mamluk territory, basically. Yeah, the only the only way they were really stopped was due to a massive coalition of European nations, really. Yeah, it was and the and only of way. course the one. half a decade, oh, yeah. decades upon decades of decline. The thing with the Ottoman Empire that we kind of have to take into account is for like the best part of eighty years, it was called the sick man of Europe, and it was That's already true. kind of dying after. Oh yes, that, yeah. yeah. The pr- yeah, the problem with the Ottoman Empire was they, that they were lacking them. in technology for, after their height. Yeah. Exactly. They were just starting to it's... decline because they were just falling behind in comparison mm. to every other European nation. Like, well, the Ottomans had the manpower, they didn't have the equipment. I feel like I should also point out it's, that it's a uh, that can be... Sorry, Peter, go ahead. The classic tale with East Asian countries where they become, um, or just Asian or Central Asian countries, with China and to a shorter note, with Japan, they become so absorbed the fact that they've accomplished so much, they just refuse to reform and eventually fall into sort of a limbo until their demise. That's exactly oh, yeah. what I was going to point out, yeah. That is that, yeah, the Ottomans, they they got so big, and I guess they thought they were at their height, so they didn't bother to revolutionize and continue growing their military and navy strength. They just let it decline. So well, that, what, no, that is were, one of They were basically the just reasons. full of themselves, and they thought that they couldn't be beat, so they didn't bother. No, no, but I mean, I should mention, one of the reasons for their downfall was the fact that because they didn't colonize them, they weren't able to utilize the trade that the Europeans did, which was yeah. the whole reason why the Europeans grew into such mega powers, because they traded with the world, they had such incredible and influence over the world, but the Ottomans fact- didn't achieve this because they didn't attempt to do any of that. Yeah. Considering so, the fact that oil wasn't a major deal, yeah, I imagine if the Ottomans were when, now, they'd be- they actually didn't have the monopoly that other countries needed to sustain their power base. Yeah. Imagine if oil was as big then as it was now. The Ottomans would be oh, the biggest power. The yeah, Ottomans yeah, would. Yeah. The Ottomans. Drastically. Think of, think of like Saudi Arabia and all the Gulf countries, right? They still, yeah, exactly. I mean, they owned the Caucasus, basically. Imagine how filthy rich the um the Ottoman dy- the dynasty. Well, how much more filthy rich they'd be if they had the oil. more. Yes. If, if, if the be... Ottoman, if the Ottoman Empire actually lasted today, they would probably be comparable to China in terms of just raw power over the resources that everyone needs. Not just resources, just ethnicities as well. Like China has like fifty six ethnicities in there. In there yes, we have fifty. We have 50. Yeah, exactly. So like the Ottoman Empire would be similar to that. Like like Rome, it would just be a country of ethnicities combined as one. I mean, just think about the Balkans itself, though. Look how split up the Balkans is nowadays, and they owned most of it. Mm. Uh, actually, one thing I like about the Ottomans is the fact that. Unlike a lot of the other, um, Europe, obviously the other, Europe, the other powers in this list, other than the Mongols, they weren't European and yet they managed to conquer Europe. Which, like, there aren't well, conquer parts. But there aren't many examples of that in history of yeah. empires managing to invade Europe, especially like, I mean, if we discount, like, well, actually, no, we shouldn't discount that. But like, the Umayyads invaded Spain, but they were so much more technologically advanced at that point. That you know, it's not quite as comparable as to the Ottoman regime. And yeah, I think they were more technologically similar with the European. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the Mongols are another example, which obviously even the uh, architecture and, and technologies and, and and sciences that the Ottomans created was just incredible. Like when yeah. I actually went to Istanbul and saw all this stuff. Yeah, when I went there as well, like, it's so it, honestly. I, I mean, I, on, Istanbul yeah. is one of my favorite places. It has to be my favorite. Very beautiful. I unfortunately haven't had the chance to go to Istanbul yet, but it is one on my travel list. 
the buzz, the bazaars are kind of funny. Yeah. Like that. Like that the way the there. the way the Ottoman managed well, to bargaining. combine the traditional um Middle Eastern culture with the Christian blood and fuse into something new is a testament to just how much they were able to assimilate. Yeah. And influence over the region. And, and, and the Ottomans, I mean, let's not forget the Ottomans almost got to Vienna, right? Oh yeah, yeah they, they were at the gates. They were close. Can we can we, can we know the massive and, and, almost and the, there? Yeah. The almost, yes. The Habsburgs. Yeah, but but then yeah. the wing passers arrived. The Habsburgs are so big. I'm proud. <laughs> I'm trying to plug your Sabbath on your show. Can we plug music? Yeah, I think it's a So what were you saying about about the gates of Vienna? It's they were there. It's, 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 yeah, they were there. It's just to show. If if we, they had the taken Vienna, it would have basically been the collapse of Central Europe. Because, the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, yeah the Holy Roman Empire is, is is based on Austria, and if Austria fell with it, the Holy Roman Empire itself. Hmm. Yeah, but then we kind of the German empires. But then there would have been like a massive coalition against the Turks, like with the remnants of the empire, and then with the Spaniards yeah, exactly. and the Russians and the Persians and everyone. And the Portuguese. Stuff in, uh, maybe, but to a lesser extent. But, like in the Mediterranean, the battles and the sheer amount of resources and ships and manpower that the Ottomans were able to summon up for so long was just staggering, yeah. honestly. And, like, yeah. and the fact that they managed to do that whilst having such a diverse range of tools. Mm. Like, the Janissaries are a key example of this. Like they're made up of Orthodox um, Albanians, mostly. Oh, they? yeah, just Bulgarian. completely converted to... They, they managed to... Yeah, yeah, exactly. They managed to assimilate these people and then form a significant and extremely effective fighting force. Like, the Janissaries were really strong. They were definitely one of the best like, fighting forces at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty amazing. It's a pretty amazing feat. Well, there's also the problem the Janissaries eventually turned back on them. The case. Yeah, yeah, that, obviously yeah that, that, that that was also a problem that they had with the Janissaries. And yeah. the biggest problem that the Ottomans really had was, like China, but like, not really like China, sorry, is the fact that it had too many ethnicities. And with that, people wanted to identify it as themselves rather than being under the Ottoman influence. Actually, I should mention something along that line. Um, if you look at the Egyptians and a lot of North African nations, for ages, they wanted to be considered Arab under... Mm. Um, the only reason they are considered Arabs today is because of the Ottoman Empire in the East. For ages, yeah. they wanted to be considered Arabs instead of Egyptians and Moroccans and Chinese oh, yeah. and stuff like that. But, I mean, that's pretty cool. Like, it's, it's, uh, much like the Spanish, it's a lasting impact on the cultural and like ethno linguistic, like you know, makeup of the world. Of the world. It's, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. It's, it's also because of the fact of the Ottomans kind of stripped every one of their like actual cultures themselves because they physically just took everything by force rather than say uh let's say spain spain did it diplomatically and also through colonization rather than through force so everything and was plagues. Oh, and plagues <laughs> yes yes plagues indeed. <laughs> influenza <laughs> but yeah even in the mediterranean against the spanish like the entire spanish empire and the venetians and the pope and the austrians like had to band together somehow to defeat the Turks. Pretty. Oh yeah, pretty. they were such a drastic power that it was impressive. Like the coalition size at the time, just to defeat one nation, mm. the, a it's, nation that was so close to taking over all of Europe. But Spanish steel prevailed. <laughs> I'm proud. I'm sorry. Uh, I think Spanish you mean Mahara. winged hussars. <laughs> it was the winged hussars. When okay, the winged so Kevin hussars Kevin Coming down, down the mountainside. Mountain <laughs> okay, right, I'm gonna stop this sabaton now. Uh, oh Peter, do you wanna enlighten us with your topic, please? Uh, um, so I'm gonna be talking about the Mongol Empire. My, I believe it would be a contender for one of the greatest empires um in the world. Now, to talk about the Mongol Empire, obviously it didn't last as long as the some of the other ones. But what I'm gonna look at is the impact that it had on a political, economical, and social aspect. And to show that although the Mongol Empire did not last very long, um, after a couple generations, the impact that it had regarding just modern civilization and society in general is massive when compared to some of the other ones. So in terms of the law, um, the Mongol Empire was governed 
by a quasi-constitution known as the Yasa, which was devised by Genghis, and it was focused on the obedience of the Khan rather than each individual tribes to assimilate all of the Mongols into um into one body. It was it was connected with people instead of the property. So for example, if a man a man would not be punished unless he was confessed guilty. Um some other examples of the Yasa would be um an animal's heart must be completely stopped before eating it. Um, execution to adulterers and sodomites, um, and order men to forgive all offenses of another soldier when hurt, and spare cities. Um, so ordered men to forgive all offenses if another soldier hurt him or something within the same army, and spare cities and countries from just being sacked when they voluntarily surrender. Um, the Mongol Empire was also quite focused on creating a meritocracy. So for example, um, officers and officials weren't appointed based on um, based on bloodline, or but instead were appointed um, based on their ability. For example, one of the highest ranking um, ministers and advisors to to um, to the Kyle actually started off as an apprentice to a blacksmith. Um, Although the Yasa acted as a constitution, it was really only available to the highest echelons of the Mongol government and were kept secret from the rest of Mongol society. Um, the Mongol Empire, contrary to popular belief, was not an autocracy. It existed where each region of the empire would be ruled by sort of a small um, parliament council made up of leaders who would convene and decide the policy of the nation. Um, each ruler of, for the region would also have a cabinet made out of advisors. Um, the cro- um, the cro- 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 Krotai was a non was the non elective national body made up of tribal leaders across the empire, and it actually elected um, the Khan, which would be very similar to a lot of the political systems that we have today. In which case, a parliamentary group would elect the leader. Um, the Mongol Empire also promoted religious freedom across all aspects of society as Genghis Khan's founder believed that it would be much easier to govern with all of the religions available also would incite political and philosophical debate that would bring growth to much more greater ideologies which would allow um, him to govern more effectively not only that the Mongol Empire also created the Yam which was a national white mail system that was intended for the military. Um, the way the Yam works was that there would be a bunch of outposts spread across 20 to 30 miles across the entire empire, and the rider would take the message and ride for 20 to 30 miles to an outpost where he could rest and recuperate, and he could either hand the message to another person or he could continue his journey um, along the Yam system. This was a highly efficient way of mailing so that the message the message will never stop. It'll always be moving, and it could deli- and could be delivered as fast as possible. Um, there were also the Mongols also pioneered in international passports known as the Paisa. Now, although the, although similar systems were used in in other Chinese and Asian empires, it was really the Mongols that brought it to sort of the international base of the usage of passports. Um, it was issued. It was issued by the it was issued by the great Khans to allow Mongol nobles and officials to demand goods and services from civilians, as well as a diplomat, as well as a form of diplomatic immunity, um, to attract to attract overseas merchants and traders. They were also given decrees and passports, which exempted them from ta- from taxes. Um, later reforms from the Khans also had. The names of the person written on their passports, so that there would be no abuse as the handing it to their person allowed them to, to enjoy the privileges. So, in terms of political systems, the Mongol Empire was among the first to create a, a sort of a rudimentary um, system, in which case the power was not focused on the autocrat. And as we see with the passports, with the passports, um, the religious freedom. And the way and the way with a constitution governed the empire, the Mongol Empire was almost the formation of um, a modern political structure that we see today. 
In terms of economy and society, considering the fact that the Mongol Empire conquered so much, um, the trade war, um, of trade war, sorry, um, the Silk Road was reopened after hundreds of years of being closed down to the Central Asian regions, such as Persia, being a volatile region due to fighting. And now, since that's done, it reopened the Silk Road, which allowed massive um, economical and cultural exchange between East and West. Um, before before the, um, the Mongols really conquered these regions, Eastern Europe and China was almost oblivious to each other as traveling from the center of China to to the center of Europe was such a dangerous undertaking that would be taken by very few and it would be um, taking decades upon decades to do. With the, with the sharing of knowledge brought by the Mongol Empire, um, skills such as paper making, printing, and gunpowder making spread from east to west through the Silk Road. Um, merchants, migrants, explorers, and refugees also brought new ideas, plants, and vegetables, and animals across continent. Um, Cross-cultural interaction between the East and the West was a regular event within the Mongol, within the Mongol Empire. Actually, the Mongols were so focused on trading that, as I mentioned previously, they gave a lot of privileges to the merchant class to incite the economic exchange. Um, the Mongols also introduced paper money that was backed by the government with precious material, which is, which is basically the dominant currency that was used for long time afterwards in the modern age, you know, paper money backed by specific precious metal, although coins, although other coins um, were used, the Mongol Empire attempted to make their paper currency the dominant system in their nation by killing anyone who didn't use it. Um, to, to explain really the true extent of how the Mongols had influenced trade and economics, um, Chinese silk appeared in Italy in 1257, and a couple year and a couple decades later, a single merchant in um, Genoa, in Genoa could um, in Genoa could sell thousands upon thousands of tons of silk since the cultural exchange was so frequent. Um, the Mongols were also quite focused on science, as it absorbed as it absorbed um medical um medical officials from Persia, India, China and Arabia and um to keep their army. Um so regarding the scientific aspects of the Mongol Empire, the Mongols attracted scientists from Persia, India, China and Arabia to form hospitals that basically bolstered the combination between Western and Eastern medicine. <gasps> Um, China employed doctors from India and the Middle East who, who were co communicated to European centers, and Kublai Khan founded an institution for the study of Western medicine. So, with just the extent of the influence that they had with the countless examples that provided, I do believe the Mongol Empire would be a strong contender for the greatest empire in terms of what it's done um, to definitely, affect society today. Yeah, yeah definitely um, in terms of land, they're the second greatest. Definitely, that that's one point they have going. Oh yeah, and I'm, I'm yeah. right in saying that, right? They are the second. Yes, greatest. they are the second um, largest empire and the largest um, continuous empire. Yeah, yeah, true, because the British were spread out over the yeah. island. And what well, the Mongols managed to basically, um, what is it, subdue the Russians, right? Which is actually pretty amazing. Yeah, very. I found that pretty amazing because, like, their empire, they managed to subdue the Chinese, they managed to subdue Central Asians, they managed to subdue like Siberians, they managed to subdue. Europeans as well. I mean, like, as well, just, their establishment of trade was just amazing. They had like, some amazing yeah. systems going on, which especially honestly, the Silk Road. If, if they didn't have them, the Mongol Empire would have collapsed so much sooner. Yeah. Like, yeah. On the word of collapse, we must converse about the sad, sad reason why the Mongol Empire collapsed. That Ooh. is because of no air. Yeah. The, the, the whole elected had whole... so many rivaling tribal areas yeah. of the Mongol yeah. er, er, eh. Empire oh, just fight out with each other, creating another just internal civil war, spreading out that once great empire into a mess. You know? know it's like even though, Yugoslavia even all over that, again. Oh, yes. Even despite that, they still would have fallen like every empire. We can oh, see eventually, yeah. every empire must fall. It just I don't, know. I don't know how much 
Yeah, my my Sorry. I'd be interested to see how much longer they would have that if that didn't happen. Because like it was such a I don't know it feels like it was a bit overextended. To how an long extent. did the Mongol Empire last for? Out of interest, like a hundred years at best. Just just over a hundred. Okay. Like I mean, yeah. which is pretty significant considering they were tribal. Yeah. Mm. Like, yeah, they were, they were they were mainly a whole that tribal tribal empire. Empire. converted itself to an empire. It was just yeah. very impressive. Like. So, something so small could become that big and so oh, immense. The, the whole reason the Chinese built the Great Wall, wasn't it? Keep that. Uh, no, uh, yes, the keep Great Wall was built way before to keep the tribes out. It wasn't just the Mongols. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. And then the Mongols when we still built, when it was built. Wait, was it the Mongols yeah. that just whammy the wall? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Did and the then Mongols they took over like wall? most of northern China. No, they took over all of China. Not all of it. They didn't take like the well, southern they, half. They, effectively, they effectively became the Yuan dynasty. And yeah, became, they were. Yeah, they, they were the Yuan dynasty. Records, they, they are the official China. ruling dynasty of China. Yeah, I guess. Do we have anything else to converse China. about? Oh, with the no. Mongols? Yeah, the Mongols. Anyone else? I don't think so. All right, good. no. Okay. Right. Um, Sean. Well, I guess we're on to me. All right, so I'm going to be discussing about the Japanese Empire now. Oh. This is what I think as being the second greatest empire, as we know the first greatest empire is Germany. Excuse me? Alright, we'll discuss that in another episode. The Central African Empire, guys? This this will be discussed at other times. Yes, we'll discuss it in another episode. Let's just go to, let's let Sean talk, guys. So, Japanese Empire. So, we know the Japanese Empire, like the Mongol Empire, is an Asian country. So, with Asian countries, especially within the later half of the um, 18th century, they were not as immense or great as a power. So because of Japan's uh, problem with Sakoku, or also known as isolationism, they were basically just a raging tribal island of just confusion, where they had no uh, connection to the outside world at all. But until the uh, introduction of Bakumatsu during the Edo period, or the final years of the Edo period, or the last years of the Shogunate, uh, eventually isolationism was removed during where the American gunboats were able to in, or kind of force a trade deal with Japan. This kind of started the beginning of Japanese industrialization and military improvements, as we see the new westernization of the Asian country. This helped start the increase of the Japanese empire and kind of gave it its prime time. So with that, the dawning of the Meiji Restoration officially began the Imperial Japanese reign. Now, Japan, in comparison to Europe, you would say is not as great as most Asian uh, European no, Asian great powers are much weaker to European great powers as European great powers are focused really on colonization. But the thing that Japan had different to European powers is that it was able to rival that of European powers, as we see especially with the Russo-Japanese War. Japan, a nation that was kind of seen as like weak, was able to beat that of Russia in a, a war against each other for land in Asia. And with that, we kind of see, uh, <coughs> sorry, kind of see how strong Japan truly is. And the big thing is that Japan has this sense of discipline in their military. They were able to industrialized their military in such a quick succession of time since the Meiji rest Restoration to the Russo Japanese War within about 40 to 50 years uh, they were able to go from basically swords and bows to guns and cannons completely in such a short amount of time rivaling that of other nations it's just so impressive that they could do this in such a quick succession of time and we see this mainly in 1900s of course but the most impressive thing of Japan was Japan's expansion, mainly during World War II and into China as well, into the Southeast Asian countries. Japan was able to take so much land within such a short amount of time, uh, mainly due to the fact that it was in a time of war, but it was able to take so much land due to the fact that it was uh, a great power that could rival other great European nations. And this kind of helps increase Japanese uh, opinion by other nations, seeing it as like, oh, this nation is actually a war, we have to deal with this thing rather than seeing it as, oh, it's just an Asian nation. Who cares? Maybe we'll colonize it later. And with that, Japan 
in such a short amount of time was able to assert itself as such a great power. Uh, but the main problem that Japan had was its downfall. Its downfall was internal efforts as well as ri- the rising popularity of communism and democracy due to uh, the fascist military dictatorship, similar to that of the shogunate. And Japan sadly collapsed and became known as the state of Japan in 1947, which to me, very sad day. The hell do you mean? I was about to say, with, with the collapse of Japan, I'm surprised you put it down to the communists and not down to the, the glorious the, land. Just the, the double whammies of the Americans. Oh, <laughs> well, the, the, the double whammies. I mean, Nagasaki officially founded... 1645. Unfounded 1945. <laughs> it's horrible. Oh. Yes, but, but I mean, uh, Japan, Japan was a, a great nation. So, I would so say, like, in within a short amount of time, it was able to assert itself as an empire in comparison I mean, to, like... Yeah. Like, well, like I, Spain. Yeah, Spain was an empire for so long. Like, with it, it did so many great things, but Japan, it was only an empire for, like, say, about... Under 100 years. Not, not just, very long. Maybe. Not Yeah, just under 100 years. It... Still, within those hundred years, it was able to achieve so much. Just the, the mass industrialization and just mobilization of an army. This is so impressive that it could do like that all the main within th- such a amount, short amount of time, as well as the westernization of culture, it reintroduced Christianity and uh, other Western cultures. Like well, you, you wouldn't see people around kimonos often enough. Yeah. Now you would see people in full-on suits. It's just impressive how like the country completely flipped itself. <laughs> one, okay. one, one thing. Um, I, I, found, I think I think is ama- is unique to the Japanese is the fighting spirit. Like you mentioned, the oh spirit. yes, the fighting <laughs> spirit I, I is so yes. dedicated. That was, the, the like, oh yeah, it, not, that that takes like order two two seven to a whole new. Oh yeah, like they it's it's not like they were forced to do it. They did it because they loved their country. They yeah. had such a dedication take, um, towards it. Take Iwo Jima as an example. Like oh, look yes, at they how kept long fighting. Again. They would it's not just, stop. A volcanic island. It was there's literally nothing there except you can use it as a staging point. Yep. But they and kept what? on to that. I mean, they didn't even need Iwo Jima in the US. They 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 thought it was going to be a couple of days and they'd be done. But how long did yep. it take them? It took them ages. It took them like it took them so long to take that. Yeah, that's why. And if you look great at the great memorable region, photo of the America saying with the flag is such yeah, yeah. thing. But yeah, Japan military wise, they were just so disciplined. Like. In fact, how I see just... empires in today's world, so, so I see a great empire is just based on colonization. Like Japan, Terrible. Japan did somewhat colonization, quote quote. Colonization, <laughs> Korea colonization. Yes, they yeah. can colonize, but mainly it was through force, like the Ottomans did, mainly just taking over land. Like Japan, Japan by itself had nothing. It had no resources, had nothing. But due to the fact that it had taken over China and Korea and a bit of Southeast Asia, it would actually had resources, but unfortunately they lost that war. The, so that was the main problem Japan had. It was a lacking country by itself. One mark I'd like to say against the Japanese was the fact that, you know how in the Russo-Japanese war they, they won substantial? Oh, yeah. Because the Europeans didn't expect them to have such a significantly advanced fleet. <laughs> But like, they, they didn't necessarily develop that on their own. I mean, they obviously mm. built them on their own. But the British, due to like the um the alliance they had, they oh got yes, a the British. It was it, it's thanks to the European powers that Japan was able to rise so quickly. Because like, yeah, without their technology, Japan would have just probably stayed as what it was, just a, and a I mean, country with throwing arrows and swords. If you don't mind, the dogs. Oh yeah, they were the under. They were kind of the black horse. Uh, in definitely, case. yeah. Well, I was gonna say like definitely in terms of become, um, going from an underdog to a um, substantial power, the Japanese are pretty unrivaled in that regard, mm. especially in Asia. Like, if you don't mean just cutting in here, Cam, uh, just uh, quickly circling back to what you were saying about their fighting spirit. The last Japanese soldier to, sur- to surrender. Uh, yeah. Oh yes, in nineteen seventy four, 1974, yes, in, March. Was it was it in Vietnam or the Philippines? Philippines. It was in the island. Yeah, in the Philippines, and he he was in the forest for so long. Impressive, say for an extra thirty years, you would just be in the forest waiting for your country to return you home. Wait for that your commanding officer to come and relieve you. 
That's, exactly, that's yeah. just complete dedication at that point. In fact, I believe there was also an instance, I don't have any record of this, but from memory, I've read an article that there was a Jap- there was a holdout of, Japan- of a Japanese commander in Iwo Jima that refused to surrender until they had to go and find his commanding officer to get him to relieve yeah, him. Yeah. yeah. Mm. What, what, when I judge the, um, the Japanese Empire, there is um, that's interesting because the Japanese didn't really start colonizing until the 1910s with Korea, obviously. So what I tend to look at is that the Japanese state, the industrialization and westernization of the Japanese state as of itself, right, mm. is unparalleled at almost any point. In roughly just 50, even less than that, 50 at most, they were able to convert their country from an isolated, um, mainly agrarian society who really had mm. the most rudimentary of firearms introduced by Nobunaga during the warlords period, um, yeah. all the way up to literally the most advanced power in Asia with a functioning constitutional um, with a functioning constitutional system that could just govern the country with the efficiency of, let's say, of another semi-constitutional monarchy, um, Austria-Hungary or even um, the German yeah, yeah. Empire. However, when you look at its actions as an empire instead of a state, unlike other countries like Spain or, or Portugal or even the Mongols, I feel like the Japanese have contributed nothing to the development of its colonies or to just civilization in general since it really almost did nothing but take extract the resource of its inhabitants all the way back to, oh, um, yeah, to the mainland back, itself. To the mainland. And the fact that it was hated by almost every one of its subjects outside of Japan proper, I think really sort of puts some puts well, yeah. the main thing, being a the successful main thing empire. Was Japan Japan at the time was the mo- one of the most nationalistic countries at the time because they saw it like Germany, they just saw themselves as kind of the Aryan of Asia. They saw themselves yeah. as the superior of Asia. So they, they kinda of saw everyone else as like under them. Which, in the case of Asia, everyone else was a lot weaker than Japan. They could really do nothing against it. So Japan was able to freely do what it wanted. I feel if you'd allow me to, I'd just also like to touch on the fact that how quickly they rebounded after Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, compared yes. to being now, yeah. they're yeah. yeah. economic. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Even, yeah. even with Article 9, they were able to rearm themselves properly. Like, yeah, but I mean, a large part of that is the American, you have to... Like, you, the Americans no poured cash into Japan. That is true. So that is true. Yeah, yeah, but it, it, it easily rate. made them one of the strongest countries. Still, like their yeah, economy. Yeah, the Japanese oh, didn't really do it. Still. The Japanese yeah, really didn't do it on their own. The reason why they were able to compete was because just it took the technology from the other country, like radios, took it back and made it better, and then exported it. Yeah, which is why yeah, the 20th it's basically century. just taking something and just improving it to make it even more yeah, efficient for themselves. That's the, Basically, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Do Do you I think? Mean, I think. I think that's a very uh, good to go. Uh, there's just one more thing I'd like to touch on quickly. Um, yeah. Just looking this up now, Japan has the third largest GDP in 2018. Yeah, yeah. yeah I thought so. In, in the 1990s, people were suspecting Japan was going to take over the um the United States until the, the housing market crash. Mm. Mm. Just amazing, put that as the fact. Oh, oh, hello. <laughs> Sorry, my cat's in the background. It's okay. This is this is our with, with this is our cat, commanding officer, cat, commanding cat. A point. Yes, the cat, the cat. <laughs> he's he's a bit angry. Anyway, cat, so cat, um, cat. I think yeah, I think we could probably uh, do you want to do like a, a general discussion of um, go for so, each. But I think we should really discuss like judge. what we truly think. What defines an empire? What constitutes an empire? Yes. Yeah. yeah. What constitutes an empire? Personally, so. Well, um, there's actually there isn't a definition having like something to do with like having land on a different island or something. I don't know. It's not. I, it's I not always it's, land on a different island though. Like, it's yeah, a, it's, a, it's like a country island. whose sole go- whose mo- greatest focus I heard was to expand its territory. The def the exact definition in a dictionary for em- empire is an extensive group of states or countries ruled over by a single monarch or oligarchy think, or sovereign yeah, state. That, that's quite basically. Much like the definition of a country and much like the definition of a continent, it's extremely hard to define it because it differs based on people and what we consider to be a country. Exactly, yeah. Um, well, two countries may have different criteria for being a country. You know, like, it's a bit weird. But either anyway, like, personally... I think we should I, all, like, individually say what... So, let's start yeah, off with sure. Cameron. 
Okay, we'll so just go through the list that we I did mean, the topics in. Yeah. yeah. So Cameron will start first, please. Okay. Personally, I think you should judge an empire based off territory, for one, because that shows, obviously, the extent of influence they had. Um, innovations they did, the, like, the size of their economy and things like that, and like their military might. I think those are like, the four sort of key things. I'm sure there's like a couple other things, but... I would also like to point head, in I'd length of time, yeah. length of the empire. I think is probably a good That's idea. That's true. Yeah, exactly. Like that mm, because it, it it affects the influence. That exactly. Yeah. Out of all of those, I mean, really want to, but I, I have to say, I still agree with the fact that the Portuguese are the second. I mean, like, I don't like the fact that I'm saying my own one, but I, I do actually genuinely think it should be the second one. Like after after I've researched and whatnot, because like. But territory, Cameron. they fulfilled it. Like I said, they had, what was it, 117 times 120, their size? 117 times 123, one of the two. Right, no, was, uh, <laughs> no, 100, 100, 112 times 112. Sure. And the British were only 107. The largest empire on earth, um, you know. I, I, that, to me, I mean, ma- makes it win the territory category, right? Judging, because they managed to expand their country due Proportionally more than the British due to their limited size. Yes. The beginning with, yeah. Um, innovation. Well, they basically innovated the, the, like the exploration, right? They innovated trade and exploration as well as in like ships and stuff like that. I think they contributed hugely to like the Europeans' knowledge of the rest of the world. Um, like, you know, and then economically, they, I don't, like, if we look at these empires, like the Spanish, I mean, well, sorry, not the Spanish, but like the British, the um, Portuguese, things like that, and the Dutch, the Dutch are another one. They all were the trade languages over their period, of course. And I think that's, that definitely shows how influential an empire is if their language becomes the de facto trade language for regions other than in Europe, like right? Asian. And the Portuguese had this, they were probably the first ones. To have. So like innovation, tick. Economy, definitely, like, they contributed to the global economy and, like, resources back to Europe. And, um, what was the other category I had, the fourth one? Uh, military. Uh, military. Military, might, yeah. Yes. Okay, the Portuguese, I don't even, I don't think they were that great militarily. Um, militarily, they were then, kind of not as seen, I would say. And then yeah. length of empire was the last category. Uh, yeah. But, like, mili- militarily, right? They, I don't, I don't definitely, I definitely don't think they are high up on that category. Is, yeah, they had like, they did some pretty amazing things with some ships in the Spice Islands in India and whatnot. But I mean, like, they were they were also seen in some combats, like especially in World War One, they were seen in that. They were also seen yeah. in a few conflicts, especially against Napoleon. But they, I don't, I don't think they were like they were mostly like a, I don't know if I could call them friendly to the rest of the Europeans. Mm-hmm. They weren't too involved in this. anyway. Okay. And then length of empire. 100% the Portuguese fall into this category, like for hundreds of years. I'd say maybe like 200 years, I don't know. But like, but I think they, they may have lasted like into the 19th century, but I wouldn't constitute them as an empire at that point. So I think they, it was, I think they became, they lost their empire status when they, when they lost Brazil pretty much, hmm. which was what, in the 1800s, remember? I think. Yeah, it was at 18, yeah. well, after Napoleon still started really Yeah, exactly, great. when they fled to Brazil. Yeah. So, oh. I, I don't know, I think I think Portugal is definitely my pick for the greatest empire, even though, definitely. Mm. Mm. Alright, so, what I personally consider to be the most important factors of an empire are longevity, com- just sheer power, and impact on the world today, and I think Spain fulfills mm. all three of those. I kind of have to agree with Cam that I agree that my own empire is the best because I've just had a look at so much of their stuff and just really feel like they achieved such a huge amount. I mean, the Spanish, they were among the first, I mean, if you can count the Canary Islands, the first Europeans to start leaving Europe to find, to found an empire and effectively the last Europeans to stop colonization when they gave up most of, you know, the, the Moroccan coast that they had and the, just the sheer amount of time that they had their influence. Well, second last European, like the French, yeah. obviously, being, not even the last, because they still have their time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but just the sheer amount of time that they held onto all of their stuff was huge. In terms of military power in Europe and in the New World, I think they were completely unparalleled. 
honestly. I mean, in Europe, they could have just... They were the great power of Europe. They fought the French, most of the German states, the Poles, and the Ottomans, effectively, at the same time, in certain points of history. And just their sheer ability to hold out and, and defend their empire was something that was pretty colossal, I think. And Actually, one, one thing I, the one thing I'd like to quickly point out is the fact that Spain, well, one thing Portugal didn't have was they weren't a major power in Europe, right? Because like, yeah. the Spanish were, the British were, the French were, the Ottomans were, but the Portuguese never were. So that, that's definitely a mark against the Portuguese, and in that regard, you could consider the Spanish better than the Portuguese, because the, the Portuguese weren't exactly dominant on every single continent. They weren't dominant in North America, Europe, or not. The Spanish were. Yeah. And, and in terms of impact to the world today, honestly, I think, I mean, English is kind of, it is the most important language on Earth today by the people who speak it and the amount of organizations around the world that use it. But I don't know if that can just be put up to the British Empire, and I think a lot of that has to do with the Americans. And in terms of just a really, really important language around the world that's still spoken almost universally in some places, Spanish has to be one of those languages and cultures that's just still so prevalent today around the world. And it, I think it's just a testament to how influential and great the empire is, even to the former empire is, even to this day. Mm. Um, who's going to That's me next. Kevin Cardell? <laughs> now, now, please, guys, come on, keep it together. Talk, now, <laughs> as much. Okay. So, you two have both agreed that your own empires are the best. Now, I kind of don't want us all to agree that our, our own empires are the best, as that is a kind of a bad thing. Uh, that being yeah, said, mm. now, will in terms of your criteria, long, or Cam and yours, longevity, the Ottoman Empire has to win, as it would survive for six centuries, which is, I oh, believe, right. one of the longest empires yeah. ever. Yes, Peter. Um, oh, okay. Now, it did not colonize, as yours did, but it did consolidate much of its own territory in its own region. So, it's a toss-up between the Ottomans and the Portuguese, in my opinion. Now, the Ottomans also, militarily, were the strongest for quite some time, but what they did not keep up with, which the Spanish and the Portuguese did keep up with, is their technology towards the end of their era, as into World War I their technology was vastly outdated. So... I, well, I, I, can I say something about that? Yeah, um, impact on the world was one of the criteria that... Um, in terms of... Because I said, like, the trade language and whatnot. But um, the Ottomans didn't have that. They weren't... I wouldn't have exactly call them a global power, a global empire, which is, like... I was going to touch on that, I, yeah. Oh, yeah, which is sort of why I'd say they don't... Exactly. Um, now, they, come to that they didn't have a global impact. What they did have an impact on is the area around them, as you mentioned, Cal. Oh, definitely, definitely. That the Egypt, they all want to be considered Arabs. However, because of this, I would not consider them the second greatest world power. I would say they're the greatest power in that region, definitely, but not world power. Now, because of that, I'm going to have to vote with Cam and say that the Portuguese Empire was the greatest, as just in terms of size and its economic ability, and just overall, it was probably the biggest empire in the world. Well, portion. Second. Well, proportionally, well, yeah. yes, second. Cool. Yeah. Okay, sure. Fair right. enough. All right, Peter? Peter? Um, well, for my criteria, and one of the reasons why I chose them all, um, um, I'm, I'm not going to vote, just say, because I find the, the concept of the greatest empire and ranking these things in general to be... Not an effective way of judging since there are so many facets that goes into the sun you want a country is successful. Yeah, to rank right. such would be almost impossible. Um the reason why I picked the Mongols is that I said my point regarding an empire or any nation in general isn't how long it lasts, but how much it affects the day, the world. Um and an interesting example to go with the Mongols would be the Soviet Union. Now, considering the fact that the Soviet Union basically had control over half of Eastern Europe and for a short while, um Basically, all of East Asia, the Soviet Empire, in terms of landmass and influence, would be compared to the size of the Mongols. However, the reason why it didn't make the cut was because it didn't have that sort of long-lasting influence. Yeah. Although the Mongol Empire only lasted for a hundred years, the influence that it has on modern society and the world as a whole could be argued to be far greater to um, 
that of Portugal, or maybe since it affected just the way people fought and lived in a way that hasn't been seen since the Romans and the Greeks in Europe. And which is why I really believe that the choice that I made regarding the Mongols is to prove um, more of a point that an empire, although in longevity does play a major role, it is all about how much they can do or how much it could impact in a short while. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. And Sean? <clears throat> well, for me, an empire is basically categorized mainly on not size, but basically uh, influence in the main region that it was stated in. So if I take Germany, for example, it had a lot of influence in Middle Europe because it kind of owned the majority of it and also was able to unite all the Germanic areas. While uh, secondly, the sec my second case is military. Military is a big thing for empire because empire to me isn't based on just I'm able to colonize, I'm able to, oh, oh look, I take I take this land through I send people there. No, it, it's it's more I will beat you in this war. I am the stronger one of the two. It's the factor of I am that being a stronger nation to that of other kingdoms to be able to proclaim yourself as an empire as you are the more dominant one in comparison to others. And lastly, I would kind of have to say it really is dependent on your kind of innovation you've contributed to the world in this case. So with, say, Portugal, it contributed with colonization, which is very, very good. And, and finding um, India and Asia. Okay, okay, Cameron, keep experience. it in your pants. <laughs> but yes, it, it definitely. It, Portuguese could definitely contribute a lot to the world. Then again, a lot of empires did. Uh, Mongol Empire helped with trade, in, especially in Asia. Spain. Uh, <laughs> made yeah. South America thing. <laughs> yeah, made South America thing. Central America, California. <laughs> uh, made California what it is today. And <laughs> Mexico. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but we'll, we'll discuss that later but yeah basically everything, it's contributed to a factor of the world that made it what it is today and also like helped innovate it in the case so mainly Portugal yeah, the but, conversation uh, that and yeah, let's get another example Germany with its massive military uh, influences in the world basically yeah. the Prussian military yeah. influencing on how to change what is the basics of high command and how a cabinet can have worked for other nations. True. So then, how, but, uh, so who did you Japanese choose overall? Yeah, exactly. Oh, the Japanese. To vote. To out, to out the, the Japanese. You know what the Japanese really contributed? Anime. <laughs> oh, but in, in seriousness, they they kind of helped in the case they they contributed to right. military discipline. Like they were so a military. Yeah, but like. What did the Manchurians get from the Japanese? Nothing. Oh, they got Pugi, Peter. That was very good. Yeah, they got Pugi. I know. Who doesn't, like want it? Who, wants the, who doesn't want the Emperor? Well, the posed Emperor. Hey. Uh, yeah, the Puppet one that no one Have some about. respect for the man. Child Emperor. Guys, if we can just he bring, the, if we can bring anyway. this part to a close, please. Sure. Yeah, now, I, think, I, I believe we've gone for quite some right. time. And, oh, well, Cam, would you like to yeah, okay, Cam, sure. you finish it? So, um, so that was just like, you know, an hour and a half of us discussing empires. Um, we've all got our own opinions, and pretty much every one of us um, differed, except Jai agreed with me. So technically I win, but, you know, no, never mind. How much did you pay, Jai? Anyway. <laughs> Jai, uh, Jai, give us a CPU, Jai. If that's the anyway. case, I'm voting for, uh, I'm voting, I'm voting for myself. Okay, okay, cool. Anyway, so, um... Now, now Jai is the well, odd one out. Sure. Let's, let's wrap it up, then. Let's wrap it up. Okay, so... Uh, well, yeah, thanks for listening to the uh, Real Life History podcast with the five of us. Next week, um, next episode, maybe they won't. We're, we're gonna, we're gonna basically see, do it with whoever's here at the time. Hopefully, yes, the five so of us will do it. There might possibly be a time where there's only four of us, or maybe even three of us, in some cases. But there'll be at not. least... At least, at least four, probably. At least, at least four or three. three. And yeah. we'll usually tend to continue this with a weekly, weekly updates. Bi weekly, sorry, bi weekly uh, videos. Essentially, we record between them. Yes. And. Plug in next week.
Yeah. Next episode, do you want to talk about what we're doing next yeah. episode? Oh, oh yeah, next actually. Next episode um, is going to be the rise of Germany and with yes. Otto von Bismarck at its Basically, heart. Kind of, and, and that's going to... Yeah, the that's gonna be fun. and formation of Germany. Yeah. So yes. that'll be coming out in two weeks. That is uh, yeah, I think I'm that'll be a fantastic episode. So the, this first ep- this um this first episode was uh, opinion based. Like we'll, we'd call them opinion specials. Essentially, we'll have yeah. the, these things throughout. The main focus of this podcast is to be history uh, based. History so, based. So an objective. Next week is going to be definitely more educational and also kind of have stuff. kind of have an opinion of what's actually happened in the case and like what could have happened. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I or, think so. It's fun or, to or speculate, even though we're not found in this. Well, so I think I think we've gone on long enough. Yes. Think, so yeah. we do all thank right. you for listening with us. Yeah. And we all hope you have a great day. Yeah. Well, this right. is. Good Bye. Night. Good evening. Good morning. Whatever. You good do. morning. Good morning. Right. Good day.